welcome to this afternoon's panel on capital history and environmental politics. Today, to perceive the link between human society and the natural environment does not require that we engage in an effort of great abstraction. Indeed, environmental issues and problems are all around us. For example, in erratic weather patterns and resource depletion on the one hand, and reflected in advertisements and political discourse on the other. What remains paradoxical, however, is the fact that the intensity and scale of societally induced environmental degradation, which rose to historically unprecedented levels during the latter half of the 20th century, is synchronous with an equally impressive increase in public concern for and attention to the biophysical world. Intuitively, one would expect widespread attention and concern not to mention the increasing amount of intellectual energy both natural scientists and social scientists have devoted to analyzing this problematic with an eye toward ameliorating human-induced environmental destruction to at least lead to a decline in the rate of destruction increasing. Yet, this has not been the case. Similarly, although societally induced global ecological desfoliation has spurred a felt need for urgent action expressed on behalf of those on the Marcion left, effective collective mobilization is virtually absent. During the 1960s, the left became increasingly involved in environmental politics. Some of those committed to Marxism have even refocused their efforts to consider a Marxian understanding of the relation between capitalism and biophysical destruction. Yet, capitalism's destruction of the environment continues unabated. Environmental politics remains situated in an uneasy relation to the Marxian left. On the one hand, the rise of the environmental movement in the 1980s, particularly in Europe, marked the sharp migration of people drawn to Marxism in the 1970s to green politics. On the other hand, a common theme of environmentalism is to impose limits to growth, sometimes expressed in conservative sentiments against technology, urbanization, and cosmopolitanism, things that the Marxian left historically took to be signals of progress. One gets a sense that environmentalism is not motivated by the utopianism that Marx sought to clarify in his own time, but a dystopia to which the Marxian left, uh, excuse me, but a dystopia uh, to which the Mar Marxian left hopes to mobilize in the service of Marxism. However, if the link, if the uh, if the link with the linkage between capital and ecological despoliation is itself historically specific, then by extension. The possibility of overcoming capital, and hence the current nature of society antithesis, um, must be historically specific as well. This panel uh, invites you to consider the relationship between the history of capital and the Marxian left, and thus the issue of history and freedom, and the entwinement of capital and biophysical nature and history in ways that challenge us to scrutinize the present and the contemporary ecological crisis in particular. Um, so we'll start with, uh, or I'll introduce the, the panelists first. Uh, to my left, we have uh, Roger Rashid, who is a founding member of the political party Quebec Solidaire and sits on the steering committee of the riding of Niargier, which first elected Amir Kadir to the Quebec National Assembly in December 2008 and re-elected him with a bigger majority in 2012. The party, which was formed in 2006, currently holds two seats in the Quebec legislature um, Rashid was also a member of Quebec Solidaire's Working Commission on the Environment from 2007 to 2012, and recently helped found Luesi Ecosocialiste, um, which is an eco-socialist network of Quebec activists. Uh, to his left, we have Eric Eichlad, who is a writer, translator, and editor, and has since the early 1990s uh, been involved in a range of left libertarian projects and movements in Scandinavia. His main fields of interest are to explore ecological philosophy, develop uh, municipalist politics, um, and also on ex exposing anti-Zionism. He's a member of the New Compass Collective in Oslo. And then finally, we have uh, Joseph Green, uh, who has been an activist in the communist movement since 1969. Since 1995, he has been the editor of the journal Communist Voice, which opposes both Stalinist, Stalinism and Trotskyism and upholds Leninist views on anti-imperialism and party building, and has put forward a program of environmental demands that are opposed to market-based measures of establishment environmentalism. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Roger. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand up because I'm a little tired. I'm a little jet-lagged. I just got back 
from the World Social Forum in Tunisia, actually the day before yesterday, a seven hour difference between here and there. So it will help me formulate my thoughts if I'm standing, no reflection upon any of the other speakers. So what do we mean by eco-social? Eco-social is, is the attempt to synthesize two important trends of radical thought in the contemporary world. One, you could call it ecological anti-capitalism, and the second one is a non-productive or productivist vision of socialism. And the attempt to synthesize the two gives us the term eco-socialism. If we relate that to the theme of the conference, utopia and program, we can say that it's an attempt to politicize utopia in the conditions of the 21st century. What do I mean by utopia is what traditionally the socialist movement used to mean by utopia, in other words, the goal of attaining a classless society. And in the conditions of the 21st century, it means attaining a classless society eventually, obviously. But with a new vision of the relationship of man to nature, one which is harmonious and does not involve the destruction of the physical environment as we know. Uh, it's a form of politicized utopia, and I believe it resembles, in part, the intellectual attempt that Marx launched way back in the middle of the 19th century. As we all know, Marx based his theoretical development on three components, right? French socialism, English political economy, and German philosophy. If we just look at French socialism for a minute, it's important to understand that in the middle of the 18th century, there were two trends in French socialism at the time. You had the utopian trend, represented by Saint-Simon, Fourier, Cabet, Proudhon. And these are the people that formulated the view of a classless society, and eventually that of a harmonious relationship of men, humankind, to nature. However, they did not believe in the political process. They believed essentially in an ethical form of socialism. And through education, people eventually would get to see the wisdom of that new approach and replace the existing society. There was another trend in French socialism at the time, which we could call political socialism, which was represented by people such as Blanqui or Louis Blanc. Blanqui was essentially a conspirator, but his attempt to organize coup d'etats in France were based on a class analysis, except he didn't think that the working class could actually take power, but revolutionaries organized in small conspiratorial sects could take power and eventually open up to the working class. That was a political strategy. Louis Blanc, another socialist, at what we call a more reformist strategy. His strategy was to organize workers' cooperatives with help from the state, and eventually, in this way, create the basis for overcoming capitalism. But it was a political strategy that is socialist held. In other words, he had to seize state power in order to transform society. What Marx did is synthesize these two. And he said, in order to attain a classless society, you have to seize state power through the agency of the working class. That's essentially what Marx did. Marx did. So it was, again, the first attempt, I think, to politicize utopia and synthesize utopia and political program in a coherent intellectual process that led to the development of the Marxist movement, the workers' movement, the communist movement, etc. Can this be done today? Do we have the intellectual tools? Do we have the social basis for such? I think yes. Uh, for the past few years, I've been involved in the anti-globalization movement, or as we call it, the ultra-globalization movement, or the global, global justice movement. And I was struck by the fact that for the past three or four years, the climate justice movement, which is often active in the World Social Forum or international conferences, has adopted many of the key theses of eco-socialism without necessarily adhering openly to eco-social. For example, if you go back to Copenhagen in 2009, when the United Nations negotiations on climate faltered, there was an alternative summit called the Klima Forum, which probably you're familiar with. What was interesting with the Klima Forum is that they made a criticism of the existing paradigm and the domination of transnational cooperation and called to go beyond that paradigm, but did not talk in clearer terms about where should we go to. A few months later, a conference was organized in Bolivia, which was called the People's Conference, 
against climate change. And what was interesting in Bolivia is that the final statement started with the following words. The structural roots of the environmental crisis lays in capitalism. And in order to solve the problem of the environmental crisis, you had to go beyond capitalism. So you could see the development and the fact that one of the key theses, one of the key tenets of eco-socialism was beginning to be absorbed and taken up by vast social movements around the world. Now, who are the people who adhere? Which are the organizations which adhere to this philosophy? One of the main ones is called Via Campesina. <coughs> Via Campesina is a confederation of 200 million small peasants around the world. So you have a huge mass organization which is becoming organized around the principles of defending small farmers and developing a model of agriculture which is no longer based on industrialization, but is based on small farms closely linked to human communities and developing a different paradigm of exploiting agriculture. That's one. Two, you have the movement which was called the Ecology of the Poor in Latin America. In other words, the fact that more and more indigenous communities in Latin America started combining environmental struggle with the call for social justice. And you see that continuously throughout Latin America in what they call the struggle against extractors. In other words, like it's wild mining and mining corporations coming in, destroying the environment and destroying the communities. So you have this development where mass movements around the world are starting to take up the fundamental tenet of eco-socialism, which is in order to overcome the environmental crisis, you have to go beyond the existing system. So how can this new vision be expressed in a coherent way? I think one of the ways we can attempt to do that is to first and foremost say that in the, in the eco socialist vision, you have a new understanding of what the fundamental contradictions of capitalism are. It is no longer only the contradiction between capital and labor. It's no longer only that basic contradiction that we see expressed through the worldwide offensive of austerity politics. But it's also through another contradiction between capital and nature. The fact that the unceasing expansion of capital seeking always the maximum gains profitable, are destroying the environment and coming up against the limits of the biophysical world in which we live. And I think the combination of these two contradictions began giving us a new theoretical framework to understand the most important struggles that we're going to have to face during the 21st century. Now, are there political parties or organizations on the political left, which are beginning to adhere to this question of eco-socialism. There are some. Syriza, for example, has elements of eco-socialism <coughs> in its program. You could ask a big comment who's here to expand on that, for example. But there's also an organization in France called the Left Front, which ran in the last presidential election with a 12% of the vote, which is orienting its program toward the development and the application of eco-socialism. <coughs> it's also found in the program of the left bloc in Portugal, the Red-Green Alliance in Denmark. And interestingly enough, beginning to make inroads in the developing world. When I was in Durban about a year and a half ago, I met a group called the Democratic Left Front, which is essentially is a breakaway from the ANC, the party of power. Activists <coughs> breaking away from the South African Communist Party, who's allied with the ANC. And in order to distinguish their political project from that of the ANC, for those who don't know what the ANC stands for, is that they claim that South Africa is right now in the stage of building a national democratic project that eventually would lead to some form of socialism. Of course, as we know, quite often, these attempts end up in just building a new capital society. So the critique that the democratic left front makes is that in the 21st century, a true vision of socialism has got to be eco-socialism, which involves principles of workers' control, self-management, participatory democracy, and a whole new way of looking at the productive forces in society. Let me deal with that problem for a minute. Quite often when we read Marxism, or we read some critiques of Marxism, we are told that one of the main problems with the Marxist vision of 
how eventually would attain socialism, is that Marxists see productive forces as developing and eventually leading to socialism, not the productive issue. What is interesting with eco-socialism is that it goes back to some of the key roots of Marxism. In one of the first works of Engels and Marx, called German ideology, Marx talks and develops very briefly the following concept, that in given circumstances, the forces of production can become forces of destruction. In other words, the fact that you develop industry, technology, new means of production on the capitalism does not mean that it's an unceasing progress. These forces can also turn into forces of destruction of the environment and of mankind. Think of nuclear energy. Think of the fossil fuel industry. Think of militarism in general, right? These are forces of destruction which emanate directly from the growth of industrialization and the application of technology. So at the earliest of time, in 1845, already Marx had a dialectical understanding of the fact that economic development by itself does not necessarily lead to progress. You have to fundamentally break with the logic of production on the capitalism. And we find, again, these ideas in his mature work, Das Kapital. What is very interesting in Das Kapital, and many of us activists from the 60s, 70s, did not realize, because we didn't read this particular chapter, the chapter is dealing with ground rent and agriculture. Now, you would assume that Marx would support the development of industrial agriculture as a development of the productive forces. And yet, in Das Kapital, Marx makes a fundamental critique of industrial agriculture as destroying two things. One, labor, and two, the natural environment. And he opts for, on the contrary, a vision of agriculture which is based on small farms and small plants of land, uh, land holding. It's something completely different to what we would expect if Marx was a productivist in that sense. And in this particular chapter of Capital, something which John Bellamy Foster has developed very interesting, he talks about a concept which is called the metabolic rift. In other words, the fact that capitalism, as it develops, creates a contradiction with nature and creates a fact that, for example, there's exhaustion of the soil. Urbanization exhausts not only the soil, but prevents a natural reconstitution of soils after extensive agriculture and urbanization. And he developed the concept that as industrialization developed, the conflict with nature becomes more and more severe. And out of that, I think we can become, we can start grounding the contradiction between capital on one hand and nature on a more sound philosophical basis. Now, does that mean that we change our view of how we build social? Does that mean that we change our view of what socialism was or was thought to be in the 20th century? I think so. I think, first of all, this view allows us to make a critique of Lenin's famous slogan that socialism is Soviet plus electricity. What is missing there is the fact that when you make revolution, when you change the social relationships, you also have to change the way you produce. Or as the Greek comrades say, you have to answer three questions. Who do you produce for? How do you produce? And what do you produce? In other words, you question the fundamental logic of capitalism and the fundamental logic of producing for the market. And you replace it with a different logic, which is that of producing for the interests of mankind with full respect of the natural environment and the limits of nature. So again, we begin seeing that this means that under this new vision of socialism, it's not a question of just taking hold of the existing means of production, existing industry, and just making sure that the uh, wealth is redistributed. You have to rethink industries and industrialization as it has developed under capitalism. For example, you have to reduce and eventually stop exploitation of fossil fuels. So what forms of energy do you develop? Renewable energy, what does it mean in terms of investments? What does it mean in terms of retraining manpower? What does it mean in terms of changing, for example, means of public transport from relying on the individual car to relying to, on public means of transport, etc., etc. So there has to be fundamental rethinking of how the productive apparatus functions 
and to what end it functions. So it begins to affect the very vision of what it means to build social. Second question, what do you do with nationalized industry? Again, social of the 20th century equated nationalization with socialization. But they're two different things. Nationalization means the state controls industry. Socialization means you democratize the running of the economy and you give workers and people control of the economy. Now, nationalization can be a step towards socialization, but it can't be the only step. And you cannot stop at saying all the means of production are technically nationalized, as for example it was in China when the Soviet Union, and conclude that ipso facto that means socialism. Social means building new relationships means also changing the way you produce and understanding that there are limits to the unceasing development of the productive process. So we see that the concept of eco-socialism also incorporates a fundamental critique of social as it has developed in the 20th century. Lastly, can we attempt to make the working class and the labor movement support the concept of of course, we all know that it's very difficult when you're dealing with unemployment, with shutdowns, to come to workers who are involved in the auto industry, or in mining, or in the nuclear industry, and so on. Your industry is slated for the garbage of history. I think one of the ways to do it is a concept which was begun to be developed, which is a concept of a just and equitable transition. You have to make a transition out of the existing paradigm into a new paradigm. There's two ways of understanding this question of just transition. It can be a defensive way. While you're making this change of paradigm, you do not want it to affect workers and people's living conditions. You want good jobs, you want to maintain unions, you want to develop uh, uh, public services, etc., which is a defensive understanding of just transition. But there's also an offensive understanding of just transition, which is you have to formulate a new social project. You have to form it a, a, an understanding of how you have to reconvert industry and what happens to the people who are displaced from old industries to new industries. And in other words, encourage labor to think positively about the future and formulate its own economic plan for moving out of one paradigm, the neoliberal paradigm that we know today, to a different paradigm which would be that of a just social society. So to finish up, I will conclude again this thing. I, I really believe that the fundamental vision that we have to develop of social in the 21st century is a vision that incorporates both ecology and social justice. I don't think there's a contradiction between the two. We have to develop the intellectual apparatus and we have, we have to develop the practice that allows to combine the two into what would be a project that engages millions and hundreds of millions of people around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, again, it's interesting to be here, part of the discussions, and here on uh, this panel on environmental politics. Uh, we hardly need to uh, um, bring up the seriousness of the crisis we're facing, uh, as uh, it uh, is on the news almost every day. Just a couple of days ago, um, uh, Lord, uh, um, this. Um, the Stern report, who wrote this <coughs> uh, about the, the climate uh, um, in 2006, uh, he said now that the, the predictions we did, we, we were wrong, that we're, the, the crisis is far more serious than we predicted back then. And this is just seven years ago. And these are environmentalists, people with privilege, high up in the governmental positions in, in the international environmental uh, movement. and. Uh, but to, to recognize that there are serious environmental problems do not necessarily mean to recognize that we are facing an ecological crisis. And when we do, do recognize that we have, we're facing an ecological crisis, not necessarily do we see that the crisis has social origins. And this goes for much of the, uh, the ecology movement and the environmental movement that uh, they do not recognize the ground causes of the ecological crisis, and I, I think I would agree with uh, 
Roche that uh, certainly capitalism is uh, a very big part of that problem uh, in having its uh, profit motives and, and growth for the sake of uh, growth. Uh, and I think that uh, it's necessary that we expand that critique to, to see that the very idea of treating nature as mere resources comes from social relations that treats human beings as mere resources. From, and the idea that we can dominate nature, that we can uh, try to, that we have a right to exploit nature, stems from hierarchical and exploitative relations within society. And I think uh, the more radical sections of the ecology movement, they recognize this and they say that uh, we, we want an ecological society. And I do not, uh, I'll try to make this uh, brief, but I do not think that it's correct to say that the ecology movement has a negative relation to productive technologies and that, that Marxism uh, it, that this contrast with Marxism, it certainly contrasts with Marxism, but most of the uh, ecology movement, the active part there, uh, do recognize the need to have uh, technology and, and science to use that, but, uh, but they insist that technology uh, should come in a different social frame, that it should be recontextualized, and um, most of the ecology movement su suggests a decentralization of technology here. It's not the technological optimism that, uh, that uh, was common for both liberalism and Marxism uh, until quite recently. Uh, but but uh, it's called for a, a decentralization that brings technology and other means of uh, production under uh, popular control. Uh, why is that so? Well, first of all, because of the impact uh, that people uh, could have an overview of how they produce, how they uh, develop technologies and science, and bring them to the best, uh, to the use of their communities and of their regions and of the ecosystem. And to bring technology down to a human scale is also important to ensure uh, human control over these things and to, to, to really bring technology and production into a new sphere that would allow for um, ethical development of the productive forces. And uh, I think uh, this, is, this is very much the promise of, uh, of the ecology movement, uh, to, 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 to rethink the whole uh, context of society. We don't think that society today is fit to develop technologies. The, the negative critique of, say, a nuclear or, a, or, or biotechnology and so on, it develops in a context where, where uh, the aim of the development is to generate profits and so on. And I do not think that, I would say along others, I, I, that this, this is the ecology movement. I don't, I, and I think that if some, uh, something characterized the environmental movement, it's, it's, it's more typical, I think, for this um, um, James Hansen or, or uh, Stern or other central figures, it's a technological optimism. They believe in that we can find and develop technocratic solutions to the crisis by we're just waiting for the new non-pollutive uh, energy sources. We're, we're waiting for the new uh, nanotechnologies that, that can that can be disposed of trash and uh, have a hold. I, I think that's more common for, for the major uh, environmental de de development, but it's what part of what distinguishes uh, the ecology movement from uh, its more environmental uh, counterparts, which basically seeks to control and regulate uh, the excesses and the uh, and the the, the problems that's caused by by uh, by the market economy and by by an uh, ecologically uh, destructive um, uh, practices. So, and it says here that uh, how does the how does the call for that the climate justice movement and the, the ecological movement those calls for direct democracy or participatory democracy how does that square in with the with, with the Marxist uh, analysis, and I think that uh, I think that the call for direct democracy it's, is within the ecology movement is a call.
for, for uh, people to take direct responsibility for the crisis, for the ecological problems. And I think that this question of responsibility is key, both for educational reasons, in order to, to, to educate people about uh, the relationship that we should have or, or um, we should develop toward nature, and also, uh, also uh, to, to make people to make people responsible, to, to become active uh, participants and, and, and put a lot of trust in common people's uh, sense. Um, and there are, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's true that um, there are new coalitions now, new uh, political parties, new uh, parliamentary parties, and uh, who, who try to integrate all these perspectives of the new social movements. Uh, but I, I don't think we should uh, be. Uh, I think we should recognize very much of our recent history has been, uh, for instance, with the development of the Green parties in uh, late and particularly in the 80s. Those were coalitions of movements. The, the, the German Greens, the, the, the biggest success story, so to speak, for for a parliamentary Green Party, was a coalition of social movements. And they was explicitly they explicitly call themselves a non-party party, and I do not see that any of the new initiatives that has come out on the European scene or or uh, or here in North America do pose anything that will uh, qualitatively uh, make them different from the Greens, who 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 was a real real social movement, social movement, and I think that. How, it's a very instructive to see how they turn into a party apparatus very, very quickly uh, when they gain votes and so. Uh, but uh, why would why would the why would the, we call for dem democracy when the problems are gro global? And that is particularly to, to because we want to, to place the emphasis on common people's responsibility in uh, in the taking. Uh, Taking action for against the ecological uh, despoli, despoliation, no, uh, devastation, and uh, so uh, one last uh, question was: uh, Does does capitalism shape our social perception of nature? And yes, it indeed does, and that is why we need to reshape our social structures and our social relations so that we can have a more uh, <coughs> uh, more uh, balanced interaction with nature, one that is not based on exploitation and, and domination. And I think that uh, that very idea that uh, we, the, we, we treat nature, so to speak, uh, as we treat each other in society, I think that's, uh, that's a crucial insight. Uh, but what lessons can be drawn? I think that one of the lessons, the first lesson, would be that ecology uh, is uh, does have a, a, a firepower on its own. I think it's it's a, it's a very radical. If we we draw out the conclusions and the uh, of, of this as a as an ideology or as a as a movement or as a philosophy or as a politics, I think it it really can help. Uh, uh, to, to reconstruct a movement that is suited to, to uh, answer the ecological challenges we face today. Second, I think that we should focus on the forms of freedom. This does not mean that we should not recognize the material basis for freedom, but what kind of social forms would be necessary? What kind of institutions do we need to ensure that people can develop non-hierarchical relations and uh, develop uh, democratic control over the means of production over over social institutions. And I also think that uh, by the ecology movements to a, lar a large extent call for a reclaiming of the commons and expansion of the commons, I do think that that is a possible path for a socialism or a uh, an ecological politics for for the coming century, and I do believe that uh, that we 
that we are obliged to, to develop the ecology movement in its own uh, right. And how does that uh, relate to capital? I think that, I think that when we develop a theory, uh, when we develop a politics that is uh, ecological or social ecological, I think that there are huge insights that we can uh, draw on from Marxism. But I do believe that the, the recent trends of creating uh, an, an eco-socialism that is uh, almost like a, uh, an old social democratic version, but with a lot of ecological components, I, I, I do think we should go even further and, and, uh, and develop a social ecological theory that, that does uh, give a very radical and coherent approach to, to the ecological crisis. Thank you. Okay, and then last we have uh, Joseph Green. Okay. One reason that so little has been achieved on the environmental front is that the working class movement is still in crisis. The class <coughs> and the environmental movement are linked. The corporations aren't going to do what's right out of the goodness of their hearts, and the working masses are the only class force which can consistently fight them. As of yet, there isn't a mass working class trend within the environmental movement of this country. That is a trend which doesn't have, just doesn't just have some working class support, but has an environmental program which stands for serious measures of direct regulation and control, as opposed to the market-based measures of the establishment environmentalist, which calls for radical change in the present privatized government apparatus. Building such a trend is not an easy matter. But we can't wait for the revolution to solve the environmental problems. That would let the world be devastated before our eyes without a struggle. But neither is it realistic to think that global warming can be averted hand in hand with neoliberalism and in harmony with the growth of financial capital. We discussed the historically specific nature of the relationship between the growth of capital and ecological devastation. We need to discuss the relationship of the present environmental fiascos to market fundamentalism. It is not enough to simply oppose the global warming denialists. Establishment environmentalism has led to a number of fiascos that have done little to help or have even made the situation worse, such as the promotion of corn ethanol in the US, the extensive search for biofuels under Kyoto, which has promoted the destruction of rainforests, the failure overall of the Kyoto system of cap and trade and carbon offsets, the promotion of allegedly clean forms of fossil fuels, and most recently, the increasing promotion of the carbon tax. Some left trends are skeptical of any action now and simply preach that environmental problems will be solved under their ideal form of society. That's sitting on one's hands, useless utopianism. Meanwhile, reformist trends have simply acted as pressure groups for an agenda that leads them to merge with establishment environmentalism. That's sitting on one's hands in another way. There are also more militant environmentalists who have built an important movement of protest that have even criticized certain market-based measures. These are valuable steps but even this militant section of the movement has backed other market measures and generally has no critique of such major establishment environmental figures as Al Gore. The left wing of the environmental movement still hasn't fully separated from establishment environmentalism. An example of what reformist environmentalism leads to can be seen in the experience of the German Greens in 1998 to 2005 when they were part of the, of the Red Green Coalition, which was the government of Germany. Greens were junior partners with the neoliberals, endorsed the war in Afghanistan, and helped impose ugly anti-working class austerity measures such as the so-called Hart score reforms, which is sort of a German form of Clinton's ending welfare as we know it. Thus the Greens backed the main programs of German capital. Other Green parties may not be in government, but they don't look seriously at what happened in Germany. Worldwide, the Greens, whatever their other promises of reform, generally back the carbon tax which is the latest neoliberal market panacea. The use of the carbon tax is one of the, way, um, as, as one of the main ways to cut down carbon emissions will be a fiasco. This tax will be passed on from the energy corporations and the polluters to their customers, so it will have only an indirect effect on, on the energy corporations. It will be just as complicated and as, and as obscure as cap and trade, as we've already seen in the way the carbon tax has been implemented in British Columbia. It will threaten to discredit the, the phrase tax to polluters by identifying it as tax to people, and it will not accomplish its aims. 
Moral, and it's not just the Greens who can't emancipate themselves from market measures. Certain of the even certain of the theoreticians who regard themselves as eco-socialists have promoted the supposed need for establishing the true value or true social cost of carbon-based fuels. This is nothing but the theoretical basis of the carbon tax. It's said that you can't fool Mother Nature, but the idea of giving things their true social cost that you supposedly can fool the invisible hand of Adam Smith. Moreover, a large part of the environmental movement has or seeks bourgeois support and funding. A few years ago, the Corporate Responsibility Project did a chart of the relationship of major environmentalist groups active in Pennsylvania with the polluters. I have reproduced this chart in a handout with a list of communist voice articles on, 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 on the other side. I would note that while I have permission from the Corporate Responsibility Project to reprint their chart, they have no connection to communist voice and they're not responsible for anything I say. Their chart is notable for trying to make sense of the spectrum of different types of groups that speak in the name of the environment, from corporate polluters in the front groups to groups that are compromised in various degrees by being funded by bourgeois foundations, if not corporations, and then finally onto those grassroots groups which are largely unfunded and uncompromised. This chart shows the problem isn't simply the public groups of the corporations, but the bourgeoisie has influence over what seems to be serious environmental groups. Indeed, when I first saw this chart, I was surprised to see an activist group like Greenpeace listed as a moderately compromised group. And then I did some research on the internet and found that in the 1990s, it had become involved with deal making with the, deal -making with the corporations and was accused of a certain amount of greenwashing. Anyway, the enthusiasm, all this illustrates the enthusiasm for the carbon tax, for example, is not because the workers are demanding it, it's because that is something that is hoped by these groups that the bourgeoisie may agree to. A working class environmental movement be one that fought this coalition between establishment envir environmentalists and corporations, rather than being silent about it or seeking measures to come to agreement with it. The environmental groups that have made their peace with market fundamentalism may still talk about aligning with the working class. This is often done with the promise of green jobs. The idea is one can promise subsidies to the bourgeoisie for green jobs, for green projects, call it green, green jobs to the workers, and unite with the pro-capitalist labor leaders. This is sort of the idea of the blue-green blue alliance of certain environmental groups with a number of trade unions. But this is not what building a truly working class environmental movement means. A working class environmental movement would be one that brings the class struggle into the environmental movement, with demand that environmental and economic planning include planning for mass welfare as an independent goal, alongside that of protecting the environment. It would mean seeking mass influence in government planning and environmental decisions, and an oversight of corporate compliance with, with environmental regulations, and would denounce the presently privatized government apparatus. Present-day environmental problems, from global warming to the devastation of the oceans, from the need to change farming me methods, measures, to the problem of the deluge of poisonous chemicals, require regulation and control, and not corporate government partnership. Marx pointed out that it was the lack of overall planning that led to the capitalist devastation of the environment. While the Australian naturalist, Timothy Flannery, in his notable book of 2005, The Weather Makers, pointed out that extensive environmental regulation would lead to economic planning as well, although for him this was a nightmare scenario. Meanwhile, the growth of capital in its current phase of market fundamentalism has led to a bourgeois reaction against even capitalist forms of regulation and planning. It's led to the denigration of so-called command and control, to the privatization of government functions, and so forth. Capitalism doesn't stand still. The decades right after World War II were the heyday of the supposed mixed capitalism, but the last few decades have been the period of rampant financialization, of market fundamentalism, of privatization of even government operations. This has affected how supposed environmental measures were carried out. For example, the system of carbon offsets in the Kyoto was a bad idea no matter how it was carried out, but in fact it was carried out in a privatized way where it was private experts hired by the corporations who were the rec rec referees for what was going on. It was the fox guarding the hen house. A serious environmental program has to demand the end of the system. We cannot put off environmental demands until revolution, but neither can there be any hope that market-based measures will be effective and that subsidizing green business initiatives and readjusting prices will suffice. Environmental progress requires the imposition of regulation and planning, 
more more is to be effective. It cannot be carried out by neoliberalized, privatized bodies, or even by the old style governed bodies. There needs to be some measure of mass oversight, or else the corporation will apply the regulations. And moreover, without this mass oversight, the planning will consist of squeezing the masses. So, so, that, so without building a working class environmental movement, there is no serious pressure to do what is needed. No doubt working class victories in this can only be partial under capitalism. And as long as capitalism exists, planning can only be partial, and government bodies will always be subject to regulatory cap capture. But constant struggle over environmental and regulatory backsliding will be one of the factors leading eventually to a new revolution in consciousness in the working class. This protracted struggle will be the bridge between the re between a revitalized program and the future utopia. However utopia, the utopia this idea may seem at present, it will look different as the world goes through major changes in the next three years. The multiple crises of the present are the harbinger of a new period of change. There is nothing so unrealistic as thinking that things will simply proceed as they, as they have in the past. And I would also like to pass out a, a handout with a series of lists of articles which are available on the internet. And then on the back it has this chart on, uh, on the relationship of the environmental groups with, uh, with the corporations and foundations. Uh, thank you. Nature is not reducible to its empirical parts, but there is a substratum, uh, which they may call the, the ecosystem. Bloch's claim, and there is a tradition for this, uh, Bloch's claim is that any utopian politics depends upon some treatment of the substratum rather than the empirical phenomena as they're expressed. Now, there's a second. Uh, Part of this, why I think it's important, because Eric is quite, I, I forgot whether it was Eric or Roger who, who mentioned this. There is a very parochial and there's a right-wing element within much of the ecology movement. It's undeniable historically. What this theory of loss does uh, is it actually makes a link between Arabic philosophy or North African philosophy and uh, modern, uh, modern philosophy. There's a, uh, one, of my, one of my students actually tried to translate part of this uh, big book, it's a huge book, uh, which is called, you get a sense of it, uh, called Abyssinia and the Aristotelian Left. And what Bluff basically argues is that there was two streams that come out of Aristotle, one of which you learn in school, Aristotle is an empiricist and sensible and so on. And whereas Plato was just this idealist lunatic. Wolf's mm -hmm. claim was that the Arabian, Arabian philosophy picked up a different strain of Aristotle, a cosmological strain, in which this substratum of nature is generated, dynamism, potentiality, and that this moves up and along the, uh, the coast of Frank, uh, Arabia, up through the Renaissance, and then gets cut off by the rise of capital. 
And so I think, you know, to at least begin to think about this uh, is a matter of some importance, both for the question of cosmopolitanism and for the notion of, 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 of an alternative theory, and finally for the practical element. Because the, the I think this gentleman, who I don't know, John? Joseph. Joseph, I'm sorry, is quite right about the Greens. I don't think we should have any illusions about the Green Party in Germany. But we should note that at the beginning of the Green Party, that was done correctly by social movement and by Rudy Duchka, who was his dominant character. Rudy Duchka was the most important person in 68 of all. He was a student of Bloch's. And he brought this to bear, this thing that I'm talking about, in the actual debates that began to raise. And it was giving that up that led exactly to what you're talking about. It's a very interesting, it's a very interesting phenomenon. So, so a, a suggestion for what it's worth. So um, we'll go Alex and then Anthony. We'll work our way. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no. No. I'll try and, um, try and put this together. Thanks so much. This is really, I, I agree with um, Stephen. Really interesting presentation. I'll think about it a bit. But I liked, uh, we both, we started and ended on the, the topic of utopia, which I was really appreciative of the panelists for doing. Um, and Roger, you, you, you mentioned during sort of the, the rise of, um, the rise of, working class politics, you have this politicization of utopia by Marx. Um, but there's, a, by, the, by the end of the talk, there was a way in which like the working class no longer was actually all that, you know, all that promising, it was for the peasants. Like peasant movements like Via Tapasia are like the place where one could locate any kind of movement beyond. That seemed like a, I'd like to hear you comment on how you understand that transition, like what has changed. Now, Eric, I, I have a very rudimentary knowledge of social ecology, but there's this move to urbanization. There's something about the move away from the country into the cities that opens up these possibilities, which seems to cut it in an opposite direction. So how do you understand that when, you know, the way in which a lot of ecological politics really look to resistance from you know, the places of resource extraction. Um, and finally, just uh, to Joseph, um, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about Barry Commoner and sort of working class politics, uh, the, the attempt to sort of merge working class politics uh, with environment in the 80s and third partyism in, in, the, in the US, and how this also seems to like fall below the threshold of like a working class movement that is actually not looking to survive by making coalitions, but is actually pushing forward and creating new possibilities. I, when I, when I would like to hear you talk a little bit more about how you think the worker movement, you started by talking about how the workers movement has, has subsided, but what do you think, it, and the, the, the need to sort of think ecologically, but how do you think this is sort of uh, conditioned the way that we sort of uh, you know, perceive ecological politics? Questions, but I, I think they connect. Okay, so we'll just, uh, if you want to answer in the way that they're presented. Sure, I'd like to. Uh, I think your question is extremely important to all of the working class in the attempt to develop eco socialism. Uh, let me just say quickly that one thing I didn't touch upon is a tremendous potential of eco socialism deals with the fact that the class alliances that you can develop in the 21st century much faster compared to what we've seen in the 20th century or the 19th century. And it came in a glaring fashion to me when I went to Bolivia. Uh, the conference on climate change, when Morales, the president of Bolivia, called it, he was hoping to have 10,000 people there. Actually, there were 35 to 40,000 people, and 95% of them were peasants from Bolivia that came down from the Andes Mountains. How do you explain that? I tried to spend some time and speak with Bolivian activists. And one very interesting thing that they told me is that you start in Bolivia, the center of the workers' movement 
was the miners' union. When I was growing up as an activist, one of the incredible images that I have is that image of Bolivian miners demonstrating by the hundreds of thousands in La Paz holding dynamite sticks, saying, we know how to use dynamite and we can use it against you. Well, what neoliberalism did in Bolivia is destroy completely the basis of that labor movement by privatizing the mines or shutting them down. What did these miners do? They had to survive. A lot of them went back to their original communities, which were peasant communities, and developed what? Lo and behold, the Coca Growers Union, out of which came Morales. Now, what they did in order to develop the Coca Growers Union is blend in elements of trade union militancy that they had learned and absorbed while being in the miners' union and combine them with the pre capitalist tradition of the indigenous communities. And out of this, you have an interesting new blend developing of, of this incredible movement mobilizing hundreds of thousands, millions of people that is attempting to develop on the basis of pre capitalist non-private forms of ownership into a modern socialist project. Now, can you do that? There's a couple of theorists that dealt with that. One was a Marxist named Jose Maria uh, who's actually Peruvian and who died in the early 1930s, he was one of the first Marxists coming out of Marxism and Marxist life because he supported the commentary, who tried to understand what would be the role of this vast exploited peasantry, which were the indigenous uh, campesinos in Bolivia. And another one is the present vice president in Bolivia, a man by the name of Alvaro Garcia Linares, who's formerly a guerrilla, who fought in the indigenous guerrillas in the late 1980s and early 1990s in Bolivia. And Alvaro Garcia Linares takes up Jose Maria and tries to apply it to the new conditions in Bolivia. And his attempt to synthesize a new class alliance calls upon the working class the mobilized peasantry, the intellectual, forming a new historic bloc, which he calls the plebeian bloc, whatever the name is, in order to be the new agency that will carry out the project of fighting against neoliberalism and opening the door to eventual socialism. So how does that relate to the working class and the working class movement? I'll give you an example. In Quebec, actually, we have a very important challenge which is namely the new pipelines, which will be carrying tar sands oil from the Alberta tar sands field all the way to the East Coast port, and eventually either export it to Europe or export it down to the refineries in Texas. In order to build this new network of pipelines, they had to go through Quebec. Now, Quebec, during the past three years, has had two important mass movements that have actually won victories. One was the anti-fracking mass movement only place in North America where fracking was stopped was in Quebec by a mobilization of communities that refused to allow oil companies to come and develop in fracking. First thing. The second one was the student movement of last year that was able to beat back the tuition hikes that the provincial government was trying to impose upon them and eventually defeated the government. So our hypothesis is as this attempt to bring tar sands oil to the eastern part of the continent, going through Quebec. We are hoping to be able to unite these two mass movements in order to block this development and appeal to labor and to working class organization to join us in that. But it's going to be difficult. One of the important and fairly militant unions in Quebec has decided to back one of the pipeline projects, hoping that it would create jobs. So what do you do? Do you enter into a conflict with labor, accuse labor of being a tool of the tar sands oil industry and capitulating to the transnationals, or do you try and work with them? One hypothesis which I submitted to labor and the environmental group is to set up some kind of a discussion table where we can get the labor unions to Quebec, the environmental groups that will launch a campaign against the Tar Sands Pipeline, and also bring in the indigenous movement, I don't know more, that is planning a spring offensive against extractive resources and pipeline. 
And out of this debate, try and find ways that we can formulate a positive project that will bring labor into this fight. Is it easy to do? No. Will it succeed? Who knows? But I think we have no choice but try. Sorry for the long answer. That's the best I could produce to answer you. All right, and then Eric, do you want to respond to the, uh, the urbanization resource extraction question? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, important to recognize uh, both the rural and the urban elements of, uh, of a new radical theory and a new radical practice. And I think that our stress on um, urbanization or, or on the city basis for a new politics, it's more a question of recognizing the importance of cities, city communities. Uh, and it's, it's not a question of denigrating the countryside or traditional communities or uh, the, the, the rural uh, landscape. It's, it's, it's a recognition of, of the city's role in promoting civil rights, civil liberties, uh, and, and in developing. Uh, uh, just, just to clarify, not to denigrate it, but that the, that the source of like, the new politics would not be urban. It's more not that, that it's dismissive of rural politics, but it seems from social ecology's perspective, the real motor of this is uh, um, these urban federations. And what happens when it's not taking place there? When what is not taking place? When, when, the, when the, the, the brunt of, you know, the place where the most exciting, Roger's assertion that the most exciting elements are not taking place in urban centers, they're taking place in, like the political edge seems to be growing there. Yeah, What's yeah. The uh, but but that uh, that's, was the part of the point that I was coming to, is that the, the recognition, oh, historical recognition of the city's importance in uh, producing and strengthening civil rights uh, and and, uh, and a political life, a politi politics that has come to itself, so to speak. Uh, today, we, we face a totally different challenge than what what uh, happened when cities emerged in history. And when I'm saying that the, the city should be the locus of a new politics, that is not against village communities or rural communities. It's against the nation state. It means that most of us who live in cities, we need to develop a political practice that is relevant for restructuring our cities where we are. Uh, but having said that, the countryside is, have a, uh, definitely ecological benefits or, or a closer connection to the land, to the, to the production, to the resources, to, to the interaction with nature. And, in a sense, we want to bring the countryside into the city and, and bring the city out to the countryside, those that are liberatory, the liberatory elements of, of city life, which, which means that uh, that opens up social possibilities and, and uh, the possibilities to, for developing a common human identity that is not based on where we're born or uh, the, the clan or family we're from or, or the, the background. And I, think, I do think that the, it's that, emphasizing the liberatory aspects of the city against the nation state. When, when I'm saying that, I think, think that a lot of the urban and ecological issues are to a very considerable extent trans-class class issues, which means that they, uh, they extend the, the traditional uh, relationship that uh, we have to the means of production, and, um, to, the, to the traditional class analysis, and I do think that the, although the inclusion of the working class, or uh, however broad or narrow you may define it, or so, uh, within a new radical movement, I I'm not sure I quite understand when you're saying that we need a working class environmental movement. I, I think that that's um, when when you're saying that I I think that that leaves us with a lot of questions. Uh, and I'm not sure that it can easily be resolved by, by using those terms. Uh, uh, but it, po it points to a different, uh, it, uh, um, an important issue, and that is who is the revolutionary subject today? How, where can we develop that consciousness that radicalizes people and to make them see the, see the connections? And I do believe that uh, the development of an ecological politics have the potentiality for radicalizing and uh, mobilizing and educating uh, ordinary people, workers, citizens uh, from all walks of life uh, in a far better sense than the traditional working class emphasis. And I think that uh, 
uh, social ecology politics definitely speaks to uh, and identifies with uh, with uh, MST or Via Campesina, the uh, those rural strong rural movements. And I see that uh, they the, their emphasis uh, on common property or, or, or on expropriation of the of the land, collective uh, running, and so on. That's uh, totally an expression that uh, I'm sympathetic to, and I think that. And then, Joseph, do you want to come on the very Conger? Okay, well, I can't speak offhand on very Conger. I don't have to That's be fine. candid. I mean, it just seems like that, you know, there's green politics, and um, at the same time you have like a working class politics, where the working class in America is stronger. You have a, a presidential candidate who's environmentalist, and even then you don't, you're, you aren't able to win. Like, you've seen that as well. Well, well, what you said may be relevant to, to those who even, even the Conger. The issue, is various environmental groups' discussion is well, we'll have working class politics, but we'll have a joint program with the, with, with, with the labor union leaders. And by having a program that guarantees them certain jobs, they'll sign up for it. So that was the, that's the so-called Bloom Green Alliance. Then you look at the union leaders who, who, are in, who are in that alliance. One is the United Auto Workers. Well, I'm from Detroit. And we've seen what the United Auto Workers have been doing to the workers for, for the last Year. They just read in the last few years to cut the wages for new hires in half. So you look at the Bloomsbury Alliance, you see the various these unions they're expecting, they're, ex they're, they're expecting to uh, fight, have been, have been agreeing to, agreeing to the, these cuts. Are they, even if these, these leaders say, oh, we're environmentalists, they're no more going to fight on that than they're going to, going, going to fight on new on the wages. Wages, etc. Well, as you pointed out in the previous discussion, that at one point, various the Quebec, where all the Quebec unions said, "Oh, we're you know we're going beyond capitalism, etc." Then you pointed out that, of course, some of them probably you know, didn't never know, meant it. Never meant it. But you could use that, you know, for the, you know for helping with green green rank and file, which is fine. But the point is, you pointed out that some of them didn't mean it, and we know that some don't mean it. So we're really going to have to develop. Mm -hmm. A work, uh, support among base of workers who are able to fight at the workplace inside their unions for a better position, not not the union leaders, but who are able to fight against the, the current leaders. These are people we have to also rely on the question on the question of the environment. It also, this issue, the, you know, workers like everyone else are going to are going to read a, an inconvenient truth. They're going to they're going to read the statements from James Hansen. They're going to read all the same things we read. And they'll see an environmental program which is set forward. And nowhere is this, is this program critiqued, except on the right wing critique, which says, oh, you know, there isn't any problem. That's not, that's not right. Or Al Gore and James Hansen and the others are right on the problem. It's, it's the solution which, which, is, which is the problem. So what you have is, you do have a section of the environmental movement which is more radical. And then the establishment movement, the climate justice movement, which is very important. Mm -hmm. You have a whole series of direct action activists. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the Greenpeace is, has its deals, but that's the Greenpeace leadership. I'm sure made a large part of the Greenpeace mm -hmm. membership don't like those deals, they didn't like them. So you have a section which, which is more radicalized, but even with that section, you don't get a, a clear critique. I've seen in many of, the, of this mm -hmm. section that they'll actually say we're against Market measures. I was real excited when I saw this. Then we're for the carbon tax, or the silence mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying you're bad people. I'm saying they haven't yet. There's still a certain step they haven't yet taken. So we need to, to, to try to find, get some people to take that step. But we also need to find to find a, to, to get a basis of working class action, which is important, which will be important for struggle for other things too. People who really mean what they say, not 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 like that. Okay, so we had um, Nate and then we'll go to the camp. Uh, sure. um, uh, thank you, Paul, for uh, speaking. Um, so, I guess, um, uh, uh, Eric, for you, I, we were just talking, you, you, you said about like, you know, like not having or sort of having to find like a political agent or subject. Um, I don't know if this.
you know, there is more or less like clarity with respect to like, you know, the tasks facing us and like we just sort of need to find like the way to carry it out. Um, but I actually feel like that's very much not the case. I think that there's actually ways in which that's sort of come up in the discussion itself or in the, talk, in the um, presentations themselves. Um, I mean, about you know, things like, for instance, you know, bringing up like small farms as kind of an alternative or like something outside of, but like, you know, capitalism. Um, but it's like, you know, like small farming can, could just as easily, it is in fact, just as easily incorporated. Um, and, but, you know, I mean, one thing that like always like, uh, I, I always get very like uncomfortable with is like, you know, certain like organic products will have these like advertisements where it's like, you know, yeah, like this is the, the will like show you like, you know, like poor farmers and stuff, you know, these are the guys who like broke their backs making this product for you. And like people kind of enjoy that aesthetically, like seeing it. And there's ways in which the environmentalist movement can actually have that aesthetic themselves, um, itself. So I mean, I guess like my question would be, you know, is the problem sort of productivism or like industrialization per se, or you know, is it sort of the kind of industrialization and development that has taken place? Um, you know, and in that sense, like what, how would we understand like the political tasks or demands in that, in that in that way? I mean, in other words, like you know, you can say like reclaim, we need to reclaim the commons, and that's all well and good, but like who's reclaiming the commons, and you know, from whom, and like why, like mm -hmm. what purpose? Um, I think that Joseph, you brought up some of. I think you, you know, made certain maybe similar points. So like my question to you would be, um, you know, what what do you think would be the like proper kind of um, political position with respect to these um, different like environmentalist um, agencies, different environmentalist organizations, um, both in terms of like I mean I guess like more like ideologically, but also strategically, like you know. The one, I mean, you know, I, I, I imagine from this chart like you don't want to, uh, you know, talk with people that you consider corporate front groups, but like the, the other ones, like you know, like what sort of political strategy do you pursue? Yeah, I mean, just just briefly, uh, I I think your know, is spot on. It. The reason I mentioned the revolutionary subject because it's a very big deal for uh, radical theory, and it has been so historically. And the, one of the things that uh, Marxism uh, emphasized was, was the, that it had found the revolutionary subject, the class that would overthrow capitalism, that had uh, no interest but to, to, to end this system. Uh, I don't think it's that clear cut, and I'm, I'm using that terminology to, to actually point out that it's far more dif difficult than uh, a, a, a simplistic class analysis would uh, would suggest, and when I'm talking about uh, the revolutionary subject and, and being, um, I, I I mean to to emphasize that uh, the the idea of overthrowing society could perhaps be best developed today by emphasizing. Uh, civic responsibility, ecological sensibility, uh, social responsibility, all those things in a different context and developing that same kind of uh, revolutionary subjectivity that working class parties and trade unions try to uh, insert in the working class it, it, in the era of proletarian radicalism where, where it was believed that workers as workers would be radicalized. I don't believe that, I think that workers definitely uh, can and should be radicalized, but it, it should be as uh, as human beings, as community members, as citizens. It sounds naive, but but uh, I think it's far. It gives us a far more liberatory uh, approach to social change than does uh, a one-dimensional uh, focus on on uh, on the um, the yeah the the, the economic. R r relationship to the means of production. And I think that uh, such an emphasis uh, would, would partly solve, in a sense, uh, the challenges you pose. OK, and if you, want, if you two want to respond to that as well, but let's keep the responses perhaps a bit briefer, or more brief, because um, there's a number of people that indicated they had questions. So. If you want to. There's a question addressed to everyone. Yeah, maybe 
in two seconds on the question of agency. I think it's an important debate. I, I, I was part of the new communist movement in the 1970s in Quebec, and I remain convinced of some of the things I said then. Of course, the form has changed, and the kind of organization we have to build is different uh, from what we built in the 70s. But I don't think we can get away from an understanding of what working class means. I, I never believed in the 70s that the revolution agency was the industrial workers. I think the working class is much vaster than just industrial working class. You know? And if you go back to Marx, he never strictly specified the proletariat as being the industrial working class. It was a much bigger definition. And the de definition was all those who do not own the means of production and do not have any control over the orientation of the means of production and the use of the means of production. That is a classical Marx definition, which Lenin, by the way, Back. So it's not the industrial working class. It can include the unemployed and can include what we call today precarious labor. And which means a whole new way of approaching organizing the working class in today's condition. I think one of the key debates that the labor movement has to engage in is what are the forms of organization that labor must engage in in the 21st century? Can it still be solely based on enterprise and the point of production? Or do we have to move to new forms of organization which, might, which are much wider and can encompass all these informal new uh, sections of, of, of the working class and of laboring people? I don't think we can escape that really. And that means having a much wider understanding of what working class means in the 21st century after we have gone through decades of delocalization and de industrialization. Okay. Um, the point of the chart isn't to say don't deal with any of the activists in, in those groups, because in most groups, except the actual corporate front, the activists actually have a, 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 reason, a reasonable motivation. Simply, don't expect these groups to, to take up to take up the struggle at a certain point. They'll betray it. For example, after the BP oil spill, I visited the website of Nature Conservancy, so it's talking about. Oh, you should be psycho, you should do this, you should do that. Say, there's an oil spill going on. Is anyone to say any, anything about, you know, about this and campaign about that? No. So we, so to later, there's an article in the New York Times. The members of the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy are really mad because it turns out that the Nature Conservancy has deals with BP and has financial relations with BP. That, of course, explains why there, there's nothing um, on the side on that. So if the members didn't, didn't want those deals, but you can see they're going to they're going to find at crucial moments that their organizations betray them. As as far as the things that are being done now, I think one important thing is is to deal with to try to start a trend of denouncing the carbon tax. But I believe that will create not only fail but will create massive unpopularity for the environmental movement among the masses, and it will be the worst catastrophe. So that after that, you'll have these groups will rely on the Buddha Dima, no mass, no, no ordinary person will, will, want, will want to talk to them. That's one thing. As if, if, there, if the carbon tax isn't the, the way to go, one needs to know what is, what is the thing to do. And it's, again, it, it's going back to regulation and control, which literally says is the horror of all horrors. But you need, you need planning. If you're, going to, if, if you're going to limit the amount of carbon emissions over the entire globe, you even need global planning to a certain extent, because you, you're adding up all the, the emissions. So planning can never, you know, uh, can only be very partial in a capitalism, but there is going to be a fight over that. And then there'll be a fight over what type of planning. Have you seen planning in, in World War II, where really plans in order to have enough steel and this and that to build the aircraft carriers and build this or that. And it squeezes, squeezes the consumption of masses. That will be the type of planning he wants, the type of planning we want. So they will fight some that. So I think these, these want to put these, these issues forward. And so you can't expect these organizations to do that. But as far as the members of the organization, yeah, you know, be as friendly, you know, friendly with them as one can. Fun that I did mention, I actually also have a collection of four articles on the table on, on the foot. On the far left, if anyone, if anyone wants to, or wants to see it. Yeah. Um, just what I have to say is kind of following up on Nate's point.
I'm sorry if this is actually more of a comment than a question. I know um, that doesn't happen often at Web Three Fest, but um, so when we're talking about, uh, you know, we were talking about Marx's criticism uh, or his understanding of ground rent and the, the depletion of the soil. You may think about it in Capital when he talks about uh, Malthus, and like the point of his comments on uh, on Malthusian politics is that like what we understand to be natural units are actually socially constituted by the way that things are produced. So I think when we're talking about that uh, productivism is something that's dead and buried, um, I wonder if that's due to the fact that it's tried and it's been tried and failed, or if it's actually just a, uh, an inability to imagine something other than the sort of scarcity that we have today. Um, you know, because like if we think about the Soviet Union as a productivist society that you know it did um, massive environmental damage, but was this really a society characterized by the sort of abundance that you know the early Marxists talked about? Like Sylvia Packer said that. You know, a social society would be a great production that supplies the abundance for all. Or Trotsky, you know, said that every American must live out cars and cigars. And, uh, um, you know, so, but like what actually, the point I think with, with Marx's criticism of uh, the way that farming was just destroying agriculture um, through short term thinking is that there wasn't like a rational sense of planning there. And I think that's also something that prevailed in the Soviet Union. Like, um, Hillel Fifton just spent like four years of making this point, says that the, the Soviet Union was actually characterized by anarchy and corruption and autocratic government. Uh, what they had as planning was also just like, you know, a system of manipulation and lying at every level about how much was being produced and how things were being produced. Mm -hmm. So like, I think to just say that the idea that we can kind of overcome scarcity through, uh, through producing more for everyone is, is a non-starter these days, uh, kind of ignores the fact that like, we've never actually had a society that's really attempted to do that and rationalize the means of production or stand the means of production in such a way. Don't you agree? Yeah, so Joseph mentioned how the carbon tax has been unpopular, but I guess I wanted to ask to what extent would actually dealing with the catastrophic challenge facing the planet require, so sort of the antithesis of Cam's question, would uh, require the lowering of material standards for uh, much of the developed worlds, and if so, um, to what extent is environmental politics predicated on austerity, uh, and if so, how will, how will it succeed in even eco-socialist politics, and what challenges does that does this uh, face the left in the present? Let's see. Well, how, how will the left address this challenge? How will the left address this challenge? I, I don't think that environmental politics will, will, requires scarcity for the masses. I give an example, a, a, a person very interested in ecology, Gar Lipow, L-I-P-O-W, wrote a book, No Hair Shirt Solutions, which is available for free download from the internet. Well, I don't agree with his own politics, but he shows from a technical point of view, with presently existing technology, not the things you hope will be developed, but things that already exist, but he says you can't really wager the world on something you hope is going to be developed. You could produce what, what is being produced now with a tremendous, with the, with the necessary reduction of, of carbon emissions. You could do it. I'm not saying the capitalists will do it, but technically it's possible. Now, so that's one thing. Secondly, it, it may be true that certain things you can't you can't produce in, in huge quantity. Like if China really tries to have a car for every person, a big car. That may be a complete disaster. Maybe that, you know, that, that's, that goes to technical impossibility. But the question of whether or not you have a good life isn't necessarily a question of whether or not you have cars. If as long as you have alternate transportation, alternate things, you may have a very good life without, without, certain, without that. Third thing I want to raise is capitalism, the drive to produce unlimited for the market means that even producing green things results in destruction, in this sense. Kyoto Protocol said various companies had to reduce, had to reduce their use of uh, certain fuels. They would use biofuels as, as, as a replacement. So the company doesn't have to ask where the biofuels come from. All it has to do is find them in the market. So a tremendous world market developed for biofuels, including palm oil. The result of palm oil was to chop, chop down forests, the remaining rainforests in Indonesia. Not only does this destroy the rainforest, but because of the peculiarity of 
of, of uh, Indonesian rainforests, which grown on peat, it causes tremendous release of, of carbon emissions. It is the absolute worst thing. So here, even as far as the Kyoto Protocol so-called worked, they'll go out buying biofuels, they created a disaster because there's no overall planning. It's always a financial incentive to do something, and the firm never has to ask where was it being produced or, or why. So in that sense, you get this what, tremendous, you could say, productive drive just to keep doing something. That said, I think if you do have a system of planning, you can produce a, a good life for everyone. And like Gar Lipnow showed, even outside the, say, the United States, how you could have the United States standard in the United States without, uh, with, with the requisite reduction, you know, redu reduction of carbon emissions. There, did you have a question? Yes. Yes. Well, um, have you indicated previously? Did you want to go? Yeah, okay. I think we have okay. conversations. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, just quickly. Um, I cannot think of an issue that calls more urgently for the revolutionary defeat and dismantling of the U.S. state and the institution of a revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat environmental crisis. I, coming off what Eric said, I don't, this, is, this can't happen with democratizing direct democracy, not just because of what the Greens did, but because it's leaving state power and the economic base, which is responsible for the destruction of, of capitalism, imperialism, responsible, nor can simply changing the culture within that structure, although I'm very much for that. So, I, I, I think it's, it's terrible to treat revolution as if it is a utopian project or some far off dream, including by judging the potential for revolution based on whatever certain sections of the population, whether they be the workers or a social movement or what have you, uh, basing your uh, basing uh, your analysis of the potential for revolution uh, on tailing after the existing conditions rather than working actively to hasten and await the development of a revolutionary um, situation. And um, I, you know, I think, and I think we have a special responsibility for this in the U.S., which, yes, China has apparently surpassed the U.S. in greenhouse gas, but nonetheless, over the long term, the U.S. is the greatest despoiler, including uh, uh, per capita of any, but any country in the world. And I would just recommend... Uh, and I did, I did want to raise with people, uh, I'm a, a proponent of Bob Avakian's new synthesis of revolution and communism. There's a strategy for making revolution. The one thing I did want to mention on this, and I think it touches on the issues that are being discussed, is this Constitution for the New Socialist Republic of America draft proposal is based on this new synthesis, and it addresses important questions of what's the relation between the globe and, uh, and different countries, or you're speaking of urban, rural, uh, this question of uh, abundance and production and curtailing that, how would economic decisions be made, um, as well as um, you know centralization and decentralization and correctly handling the contradictions of that. So, but revolution. Nothing less. I'd like to briefly comment on that because I'm very happy you bring it up. I think now uh, it's very obvious that I disagree uh, completely with the, this presentation you have. I wouldn't accept the dictatorship, whether proletarian or environmental. And I think that that does point to a very important distinction between social ecology and uh, traditional kinds of Marxist Leninism or. Uh, new synthesis of uh, of those. I, I do believe that if we are to have any hopes of creating an ecological society, not just one who can regulate 
uh, uh, pollution and, uh, and ex uh, exploitation of nature. I mean, if we're going to move toward a, uh, uh, an ecological society, it has to be someone that is libertarian, direct, democratic, and uh, collectivistic. And I do believe that bringing in those utopian ideals and that utopian tradition of socialism is precisely on one of these points that I believe we can develop an ecological humanism for our, our time, which can answer the crisis in a, a diametrically different, uh, uh, have a diametrically different approach to, to the one you're proposing. And of course you live under a dictatorship right now, you recognize that, correct? I don't, think it's, I don't think it's very helpful to, 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 to put on a mark on calling a dictatorship or tossing around words like fascism or tossing around words like revolution. I, I don't think it's very helpful. We can discuss exactly how this society is structured, but uh, uh, like uh, this black and white terminology uh, doesn't help. Well, we do profoundly consider. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, was there another? Well, yeah, I have uh, one question. Um, uh, we already touched on the tar sands uh, earlier. I guess this question is mainly directed at you, Roger, but I'd love to hear everyone else comment because uh, it's kind of much more particularized. Uh, to me, uh, I live in Toronto, so you know we're seeing uh, news reports all the time about uh, the tar sands yeah. and the way that not only is it a Canadian issue, but it's a global issue mm -hmm. in the scope of the uh, environmental uh, d the disaster that it kind of constitutes. Um, but what I was wondering is how uh, particularly it really is a kind of a case study of how labor and the environmental cause butt heads at times. There's 100,000 workers there in the tar sands. And so to just kind of call for, say for example, shut down the tar sands is to bring you head to head against probably uh, the entire Alberta labor movement to a certain extent. So I was wondering uh, about how you would comment on the idea of, of the way that scope plays into this. Insofar as is there an environmental crisis that's so devastating that you just have to say, forget the labor, we have to deal with this right now. Or do we have to accept the fact that maybe also practically there is no way to deal with this except through engaging those workers and if that's the case, you have to engage them at where they're at at that point in time, such that maybe even if your goal is to shut down the tar sands, you can't actually even come out with that initially as a fan. So I was just wondering about uh, the case study that is the tar sands and the way that uh, this whole panel seems very much geared towards that as like a practical issue. So. Yeah, I think it's a very important issue because I've been grappling with that and I've been meeting and discussing with a union in Canada, which is called CEP, Communication Energy and Paper Workers, which happens to be the main union uh, organizing uh, workers in the tar sands industry. It's a complicated problem. Now, what is interesting about CEP is two things. One, they've tried to formulate a policy of opposing pipelines, namely Northern Gateway Pipeline, which carries tar sands oil west through Canada, to Kitimat on the British Columbia coast, and have supported the blocking of that project by indigenous communities and environmentalists. They've also supported the blocking of the Keystone pipeline, which goes south from Alberta tar sands into the US. Now, part of the problem, is I've had discussion with some of the leadership, is that they cannot formulate a policy which is shutting down the tar sands. But they've tried to formulate some kind of a policy which calls upon refining tar sands oil in Canada and limiting the expansion of tar sands oil in Canada so as not to produce more and continuously you know, pollute the planet, which is an interesting approach, a temporary kind of approach, how long it can last and, and, and without actually dealing with the question of the tar sands is important. So that's one way in which they try to deal with the question. The other way is an organizational way. The problem of CP is that the main source of their dues today comes from tar sand oil workers. So you have a union which is fairly militant, but whose main dues base 
is coming from tar sands oil production and potentially conserved. What do you do? They formulated a project of merging with the auto workers union and creating a big industrial union in Canada. And I think partially in order to overcome this problem so that the fact that the main dues base right now is tar sands oil worker does not completely overshadow the union policy. An interesting thing. And within that new merge union, they plan to put the question of changing the organizational structure of labor to open it up to new sections of the working class, precarious workers, marginalized workers, racialized workers, and make that a key plank in the new platform. So you've got two interesting developments in labor, an organizational answer and a partial programmatic answer. How can you work with them to continuously develop that? Those are some of the things that we have to do. I don't think it's an easy way. I don't think it can be dealt with denunciation. I don't think it can be dealt with boycotting them. You have to engage them in the debate. Part of what the environmentalist movement and some activists have tried to do is establish a network in Canada called the Green Economy Network to begin that debate with organizing. It's something that we're going to try and do in Quebec. Now, the problem with the Green Economy Project is how do you formulate it? Do you formulate it in a green capitalist way? In other words, you greenwash the existing system and you add renewable energy? Or do you formulate it as a transition to a different type of society? Hopefully, we can do the latter. But those are some of the challenges I think that we face and I think that we have to engage. So when you're talking about bringing working class politics, into the environmentalist movement, I think those are the issues that we have to engage. And I don't think we can solve them by decree. Those are things that you have to try and solve practically to deal with the contradiction, as my friend there would call them, contradictions among the people. You have to find a way to deal with them and hopefully find a progressive way out of the problem. Coming back to the question of revolution, I, I'm far from being opposed to the concept. On the contrary, I think it's a key concept. And we have to reformulate it in the 21st century. Now, what do we mean by revolution? Do we mean Lenin's formula, uh, which was seizing the Winter Palace, establishing Soviets around the country, and then defending it in the Civil War? This is definitely one form. Is it Mao's protracted people's war? Or is it something new which is developing in the 21st century, which Martha Hardiker, by the way, who lives in Venezuela, calls the attempt to develop the anti-neoliberal movement into a world-changing movement through temporary transitional forms, which is, for example, what Chavez was trying to do in Venezuela, what Morales is trying to do in Bolivia, which he calls a government of the social movement, which only partially controls some elements of the state and partially controls some elements of the economy and is facing continual imperialist attempt to overthrow these governments and also local social movements which are attempting to push the process further into a more revolutionary direction. Is that the form that revolution might take in the 21st century? Maybe. But I think if we want to be revolutionary, I think we have to adopt a concept of revolution which is more than just a program, more than just an organization, but an attempt to concretely change the existing state of things and therefore get engaged in the material movements which are changing society and try and make them progress towards a vision of utopia, classless society, etc. Cetera, et cetera. That's, that's my view. Okay, well, we're 15 minutes over already, um, but and since that's the case, does anybody want to give some final concluding remarks or we can just uh, go after I'm just given one. You don't want to repeat that. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.